Hi, uh, everyone. Um, and like uh, Colin said, I'm a recovering academic. I've got my uh, clicker from my thesis defense, which is hopefully good luck. Uh, I'm going to be talking about compiling EdgeQL, um, which is subtitled uh, Standing on the Shoulders of Giants, because uh, we think we have, with EdgeDB and EdgeQL, uh, seen a little further um than others and we think a lot of the reason we've done that is because uh we're standing on the shoulder of a giant postgres so i'm going to talk about three main different things uh, as to how edgeql and edgedb leverage postgres first uh, schema mapping how we map our notion of a schema which has been discussed a bunch in previous talks onto a postgres sql schema I'm going to talk about query compilation, how we take an EdgeQL query and turn it into a Postgres SQL query. I'm gonna talk about uh, why Postgres, why did we build this on Postgres instead of uh, um, on MySQL or SQL Server or Oracle or Mongo or something. <laughs> um, so first, uh, schema mapping. Um, the, the heart of it is types. Um, the heart of EdgeDB databases are object types, and every object type is represented with a SQL table. For every object type in your schema, we will create a Postgres SQL table. Uh, but just that's not that interesting. We want to talk about what goes into that table. Uh, so like we talked about, one thing that goes into all of them is an ID field. But on top of that, we want to put in all of the data that was declared in the schema. So the most basic sort of data that might be on an object is a single link or a single property that points to zero or one of something else. Uh, and this is mapped into Postgres in a pretty obvious way. Uh, every single property uh, on an EdgeDB object maps to just a column in the SQL table. So if we have a property name that holds a string, that's just a text column in the SQL table. Links are very slightly more interesting because we represent links by storing the UUID of the object that's pointed to. So it's just a UUID column. Uh, in this case, it's a required link, so it's marked as not null. The most interesting part of this is actually something that isn't here. You might be used to, in some of your SQL schemas having a foreign key specified here saying that this is a foreign key referencing the primary key of some other table foo. Um, we don't use that here because we don't need to. Uh, EdgeQL queries by construction can't have, can't insert or update to a, to point to an object that doesn't exist. Uh, and so we don't need to use foreign keys to ensure consistency because it's ensured by the type checker, by the query compilation, by the entire construction of it. And so we get a little performance out of that. Uh, in this example, there's one fib I'm telling the column names here, I've written nice column names. Uh, in the actual implementation, column names are unreadable machine generated things for technical reasons. <laughs> Uh, a little more interesting than single links and single properties, though, are multi-links. And this is because like a good SQL, a good relational database that stores things in normalized form, we don't want to store multiple links in a single table role. That's not the relational way. The way you're supposed to do it and the way that Postgres is optimized for doing it is to create a link table, a separate table that maps as a relation between the source of a multi-link and the things that it's pointing to. And so when you declare a multi-link like this, we will create a link table that has a source and a target field from for the source of the link uh, to the targets of the link. We put a unique constraint on it because all the links are unique and that helps drive an index. And we also add a reverse index here on the target so that you can go from targets to sources using EdgeQL backlinks. Um, there are a few other things that we do in the schema, and all of them are mostly pretty straightforward. Uh, indexes in EdgeQL are unsurprisingly realized as indexes in Postgres SQL. Constraints are Postgres constraints. Uh, custom scalar types uh, are SQL domain types or Postgres domain types. Uh, type inheritance is a little bit more interesting. So if you remember from our example Netflix schema, we have a content abstract type that has descendants, uh, TV show and movies, and you could select content and get 
data from that. Uh, the way we implement that is we create a Postgres view that is a union of all its descendants. So we have a view for content that unions together the tables for uh, TV show and movie, including all of the columns that are included in content. Uh, that handles things for the select side when you're doing inserts or when you're doing updates uh, and deletes, which can update or delete things from multiple ones. Uh, the view doesn't help us and we need to do some actual work on the compiler side, but the, the key idea is we use a view for most of the important queries. So that covers basically all of the details or all of the most interesting details about how things go into the schema. And so now we're going to talk a bit about how we go from an EdgeQL query to a Postgres SQL query. Um, and the compiler is built in a fairly traditional sort of multi-stage step. Uh, I guess I'm fibbing a little here in that I've written two phases. There's really a phase before it, which takes the textual string of EdgeQL and lexes and parses it into an EdgeQL AST. Um, and that's like the first third of any book on compilers. And I just sort of forgot to put it on the phase list because it's also by far the least interesting part about writing <laughs> a compiler, even though we actually did some interesting stuff on that side, the custom Python parser generator. Uh, but the, the two main phases as I think about them are an EdgeQL to intermediate representation phase, where we compile to uh, intermediate representation for our queries that represents data or represents the query in a more simple way. And then an intermediate representation to SQL uh, phase. And uh, we actually have another phase in front of all of that for the GraphQL front end we touched on a bit where we will convert from GraphQL to EdgeQL, uh, which is another place where we're using in addition to the query builder, EdgeQL as a target language and having it work pretty well. But so now I'm going to dive into some of the actual parts of the EdgeQL to intermediate representation uh, step. One of the sort of first and most core bits is name resolution. We have a query on the left and a schema that it's writing that it's referring to on the right, and we need to figure out what each of the names actually refers to. Uh, the query on the left is a very simplified version of the Netflix content movie schema with just movies and persons uh, and title renamed to name for reasons I'll get into in a minute for explanatory purposes. Uh, so if we run through name resolution, we quickly figure out that movie refers to uh, the type movie. Uh, actors refers to that link actors. The name on actors refers to the name that's a property in person. And then the name at the bottom of the whole query refers to uh, the property name. And this is all pretty straightforward, except for the one interesting bit, which was how uh, those names got resolved. And that ties into another bit that runs basically in parallel and very interdependent with name resolution of type resolution. And so this is also uh, pretty straightforward to understand. As we're doing it, we figure out that movie refers to a movie. Uh, actors refers to a person. And then because we know that actors refers to a person, that allows us to do the name resolution on that name in its shape and figure out that name is a stir. And similarly, this other name, also a stir. Uh, the literal dune, unsurprisingly, a stir. Uh, and then since we have to do this for all the pieces in order to verify everything, uh, you know, that, that whole expression in the filter is a bool. Um, and the most interesting or useful part about this from a user's perspective is that all of this type information, the types of all of the fields in these shapes that actors as a person and that that subshape contains a thing name with a stir, all of that gets returned to the client if you're using the binary protocol. And so our clients are able to get a very rich understanding of the data, knowing the types of everything and the names of everything and can provide a very idiomatic interface in their languages. In, in Python, even without knowing any of the type information in advance, uh, we get all of the things in the right type and can you know, provide access just with dot access and everything like that. Uh, and a lot of other database clients make it much harder if you want to have the type information. Um, we also do cardinality inference where everything in the query, we figure out how many objects it might return. So here, uh, movie, because movie is a 
object that's just a table. It could be an empty table. It could have one element. It could have a million. Uh, we infer the cardinality is many, and many means it could be anything. It could be zero. It could be infinite, not infinite. Uh, actors, because it's uh, just a multi-link, also has cardinality many. Um, and then uh, name, because it's a single property uh, and a single required property, it has cardinality one. Um, if it was single but not required, it would have a different cardinality at most one, which means that it could be empty. Uh, we also know that name is one because it's a required single property. And the literal dune also has cardinality one because it's a literal string. Uh, but then the most interesting part about this is that we also, because we've done this filter on an exclusively constrained name, because uh, in this example, each movie, we can only have uh, one movie with each name, so there can only be one Dune, which obviously is a little counterfactual. There are several Dunes and maybe only one worth having. Um, we can infer that the cardinal of the entire thing is at most one. It may be empty, but it can't be more than one because uh, name is an exclusive constraint. Um, and all of this cardinality inference is used to drive the compilation a little and the output format and is returned to the client. So it knows whether there's only one result. It knows um, for each of the fields, how many things can be there. Um, there are a few other things we do. One is uh, scope tree inference. Uh, this is not going to be on the test, but core to the semantics of EdgeDB on a sort of theoretical semantics level is that when we have a common path reference uh, in a query, like movie being referred to in two places here, unless they're all in aggregates, uh, it gets hoisted out. Um, there's some discussion of this idea in a different form on our website, but again, it really won't be on the test. Um, more interesting maybe is we do a lot of converting complex constructs to more primitive ones. Uh, for example, if we have an array of integers and we want to cast it to an array of strings, uh, Postgres doesn't have a way to do that all at once. So we have to unpack the array into a set, uh, cast the individual elements, and then array egg it back into an array. Uh, maybe more useful is let's say we have a JSON query argument and want that that represents JSON dictionaries or JSON objects that have a name and an age field. And we want to cast that into a named tuple. Uh, we translate that into code that calls JSON get with the different fields we're trying to access and then does the appropriate cast. So name goes to stir, age goes to n64. Um, and a bunch of other stuff lives in this too. Um, we resolve overloaded functions to which of the particular overloads it might be. We inline the code for computed properties and links. Uh, we insert implicit limits and type name computations into the queries from the CLI. Uh, when you're doing CLI, there's usually an implicit limit so you don't get overwhelmed with data. And we insert type names into the objects we return to provide more useful uh, results. And most of our error checking lives here because the earlier in the pipeline it lives, the better source uh, information we can give about where the problem came from. Um, Next, after that, we have to compile from the intermediate representation to SQL. Uh, and so we generate that SQL based on the intermediate representation and this scope tree that we've built that represents that um, not on the test uh, lifting of common path references. Um, and the compiler is actually structured in a kind of interesting way. We build the query in a way that I will call semi lazily, in which um, you have a, when you have stuff like a object reference and then a shape on it, when we go down to compile the object, we generate code that joins in, a subquery that joins in the tables being accessed, but doesn't add any column accesses to it. And then once we go to compile the shape, we see, oh, we're trying to access these things on this relation we grabbed over there. So now we need to go back in there and add in the column accesses. That sort of builds it up and then pulls the data out later. And then importantly, we serialize all the results into the appropriate output format, um, which is a good time to talk about output formats. So the main output format we have is a binary format uh, where data is returned as native PostgreSQL types, uh, stirs are returned as text, uh, int64s are returned as int8s. Uh, object shapes 
get returned as tuples um, and properties and links that have multiple elements, which is one of the core things that we make it easy to do. Um, when you're selecting like the shape of, you know, movie and all the actors, that actors field has multiple elements. We represent that as an array, which will be an array of tuples here. Um, and like I touched on before, the client is returned to type descriptor describing all this output. Uh, we also importantly have a direct JSON output mode uh, where instead of this binary format, we output all the data directly as JSON. Um, this is less rich from a client perspective. It's uh, if you're trying to operate on the data from the direct client, it's probably not what you want. But if you just want a really simple, if you want to make a query and then return it from an endpoint um, without doing any real server-side processing, the JSON mode is a really nice, fast way to do that. You get all the JSON produced efficiently in the database query and don't need to do it on your app server. Uh, so that lets us put sort of this all together um, with a movie query uh, that um, selects the name and the runtime of a movie and uh, the cast and their names. And uh, approximately the query on the right is what we get. I, I cleaned it up a little bit to fit on the slide um, some of the rough edges. But the nice thing is even if we generate code with rough edges, Postgres is very good at, at removing um, things like an extra select around things. Or, uh, But basically here, the idea right is down at the bottom. You can see us uh, selecting from a movie table and then our, um, we're returning a, a tuple containing all the fields we want, including in a subquery, we are doing an array egg of, uh, or we select from a link to the cast, joined against persons, and build all that up. All right, so now that I've talked about how Postgres, I'm going to talk about why Postgres. Uh, first, an important thing is we target Postgres SQL. We don't target uh, quote, SQL. And there are a few reasons for that. One, Postgres is an extremely powerful query engine. It, uh, you can give it complex queries and it does a great job uh, running them. Uh, it has important features like lateral join and it has them for a long time and well-optimized. Um, and in general, targeting one engine allows us to be much better focused. Um, we can take advantage of the one database we're supporting and design something that really pushes it to its limits instead of being spread thin, trying to target the intersection of a bunch of different databases. But even with all that, we push Postgres pretty hard. Uh, so one example of a thing that works great in Postgres, but maybe wouldn't other places, is arrays, which we make uh, very heavy use of, both as part of our binary output format and uh, sometimes internally. Uh, but arrays are not a universal feature. Uh, MySQL sort of has arrays as of a couple years ago, but only in that it has JSON, and a JSON value could be an array of JSON. Uh, but there's no way to have an array of integers or an array of tuples. Um, and speaking of tuples, uh, EdgeDB supports ad hoc tuple types, which SQL actually has very support very poor support for operating on. Uh, Postgres is just good enough, uh, and a lot of other databases I think aren't, to do things like access an element from a tuple. Uh, but even in Postgres, it requires some kind of silly things. Uh, to project out of a tuple, we actually pack it into an array, then we unnest that array and read the element out of the column definition list. Uh, though I think Elvis actually had to submit a patch upstream to get that to work. Uh, Postgres also has transactional DDL. Um, so changes to the schema can be made inside transactions. And then, of course, since they're in transactions, uh, they can be rolled back if they needed to be. This is really important uh, for a couple of reasons. One, a migration step could fail. Uh, you could have some cast in there or some, some check that fails, and you need to give up and roll back. Uh, and it might be possible to implement that ourselves on top of non-transactional DDL, but really wouldn't want to. But more importantly than that, partially completed migrations uh, shouldn't be visible. Um, if there's a migration in progress, that shouldn't be apparent to any client because the, the database just isn't in um, uh, a reasonable state. Uh, unfortunately, lots of other databases other than Postgres don't support transactional DDL, which would make it really hard for us to provide the experience we want for migrations. 
but separate from that, Postgres is just good. It's a good query engine. It's a good database. Uh, the biggest complaint we have about it is that we don't think SQL is um, really stands up in a modern light anymore. But uh, but Postgres still does a great job, and we think that among other things, EdgeDB actually really helps Postgres shine through. 